And there we go. We are on TV, folks. So I will officially open the Ferndale City Council meeting of Monday, January 10th, 2011. It is 7.31 p.m. First item on the agenda, Madam Clerk. We have Pledge of Allegiance, and we are honored today with um, Special Brownie Troop number 73570 from JFK Elementary School. They're going to lead us in the pledge, and they're going to treat us to a song. Welcome, ladies. <coughs> Now the Pledge of Allegiance. You can go ahead. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Very much, girls. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. The next generation of leaders are here in Ferndale. I've already challenged them all to run for council. <laughs> next item on the agenda, Madam Clerk. Roll call, Your Honor. Council Members Galloway. Here. Lennon. Here. Kiana? Here. And Mayor Pro Tem Baker? Here. And next item? We have approval of the agenda, Your Honor. And if I may request um, that due to the public hearing for the Plant Rehabilitation and De Industrial Development District number 40 not being um, properly noticed, if we could pull that public hearing and schedule <coughs> it for January 24th. And then if we could add um, a resolution of condolence for the family of James Rents to the end of the regular agenda. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. Second. Moved by Lennon, supported by Piano. Vote when you're ready. Okay. <laughs> Council members Galloway? Yes. Lennon? Yes. Piano? Yes. And Mayor Proton Baker? Yes. Thank you very much, Runner. We now have um, our first presentation, this one from the Ferndale Public Schools. I know we won't be welcoming Jessica Stilger because she's on maternity leave. I see Stephanie Hall. Welcome. Please send our congratulations to Jessica. Thank you. Jessica had her baby on uh, December 5th, and uh, I'm doing double, triple, quadruple duty during that time. <laughs> um, she's very, very missed. Uh, I have several things to share with you. Uh, first and foremost is how to find out information about the school district. The three days before Jessica had her baby, she finished our new website. And it is uh, much more user friendly. Um, it is in the 21st century as far as our end, which you may not notice, but we can uh, update it from anywhere in the world now if we have a computer and uh, we're you know, much more on top of things with um, emergencies or snow days and things like that. So we want to point that out to everyone. In the back of the room, I put our cards for signing up to receive information from uh, the district on our weekly fi Friday fan out. I have copies of the newsletter that is back there uh, from, from this week and that is always posted online uh, and people can sign up for that anytime. I have a couple of uh, things that are uh, Ferndale relevant that I wanted you to know about. Uh, in the fall, we had an outstanding football player, Anthony Garland, who's a Ferndale resident, uh, who was recognized as All-State 
first team for his outstanding uh, season in football. Um, I am not a football fan, although I live with one, and uh, I recognize being on the field the greatness and watching this player. He is um, second in the state of Michigan for his 1,900 yards of rushing and fifth in the nation. Uh, it was absolutely outstanding. He received a full sco athletic scholarship to Central Mich Michigan University, so he'll be playing for them next year. So uh, he is not only a great uh, athlete, but he's a good scholar, and we're really, really proud of him. He was recognized at Ferndale's um, Board of Education meeting last month, and you can see a video clip of his uh, season on our cable channel right now. Um, our December 20th meeting is running on cable. Uh, that has uh, the marching band featured and Anthony Garland. And our December 6th special election, um, meeting about the election is also running in case anyone wants to see that meeting. Uh, as you know, our district serves uh, students from four municipalities, all of Pleasant Ridge, the east side of the Charter t Township of Royal Oak, and large areas of Oak Park, and of course, large, uh, most of Ferndale. Um, each of these communities manages the elections for our school boards and, um, and for bonds. And at that December 6th election, our board um, heard public comment, which you can hear if you turn to our cable channel, with several points of view. And then after hearing from the community, the board voted on uh, the following plan, which affects the election process here. From now on, all regular elections for the Office of School Board Member will be held on the November regular election date in even years. In addition, they determined that uh, board terms of office will be changed from four years to six years. The next board of um, election, um, the next election for our board members will be in November of 2012. If you want more detail on that, our, November, our December issue of our newsletter, which is online, has an extended article and it explains each board member's extension. They went from six months to 18 months and the extension to round everyone to that six-year term uh, to the next election. Uh, they didn't actually extend a six-year six -year term. They extended six months or 18, 18 months. But um, if you turn to that, you can see that. Uh, there's one more thing I wanted to tell you. Oh, Councilman Galloway came to us almost 10 years ago now and asked us to start um, an annual tradition now of bringing realtors from our community into the school district once a year. And we have expanded it each year. Uh, that last year we expanded it to invite elected officials and members of the business community and uh, <laughs> that the people who come say that it's so successful, so important to them to hear from our students and come inside Ferndale High School and see what's going on there that, the, that we have now partnered with the Ferndale Area Chamber of Commerce and will be hosting an event that is open to anyone in the community who owns a business, who is elected official, um, is selling homes in our community and um, we have a flyer here that we have been sending around inviting people to this event which is Tuesday morning, February 1st. It's at 8 o'clock, 8 to 9.30, which is the Chamber's regular monthly coffee connection time. And it is at the Media Center at Ferndale High School. Again, that's February 1st, 8 to 9.30 a.m. And we hope that you'll all be able to come. And that's what I have for you. Any questions from the Council for Ms. Hall? You can confirm me as an RSVP to that event. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Happy New Year. And our next agenda item. We have a presentation by the Ferndale Beautification Commission of the Holiday Lights Beautification Awards. And I understand that things will be a little bit different this yes, time. That are. Peggy yes. has worked with Dell mm -hmm. to put together a video presentation. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Uh huh. Good evening, Mayor and Council, and uh, it's a new year, and we have a new way of presenting the Holiday Light Awards. Um, we were lucky enough to have uh, Del Schmidt, the Ferndale Cable Director, ride around with us and take pictures of the homes that we selected, and, um, and he's put together a little uh, video, and after we see it, it's about a five-minute video, and after we see it, then we'll uh, present the uh, certificates like we normally do. So if they would just start it for me.
You'll see he has the addresses posted there. Maybe uh, mm -hmm. it's a neighbor of yours or someone you know. And So this is John Kennedy at 506 yep. West Maplehurst? Yes, it is. Yes. Uh-huh. Isn't that beautiful? I know. <laughs> this is our first time doing it. We'll work on that. <laughs> This is a house that has the porch off on this. Uh, actually, the porch is around the side of the house, so it's kind of unique because they can decorate all the way across the front like that. And here's the one on Pearson. So this is Bruce and Sherry Eaton at 1716 Pearson? Yes, uh-huh. We kind of look for houses that are, uh, have a lot of uh, creativity and uh, have put some work into them, and this was certainly one of those. We should have kept the brownies to sing Christmas carols. I know. We'll, we'll do better next year. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. This is great, Peggy. Is that moving? I think so. It's alive. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have a lot of fun riding around and uh, selecting and looking at all the different houses. I always say we're getting ideas for our house for next year. And this is 2448 Bonner. <coughs> the Myers family? Yes, it is. Uh -huh. That's another one that you can tell took a lot of time and uh, a lot of thought when they put it together. <laughs> and didn't Dell do a great job with the shots that he took? Absolutely. We would ride around one section of the city. We'd divide the city by Nine Mile and Woodward, and then we'd ride around and we'd have a few potentials, and then we'd pick one, and then we'd go back and he would uh, film it for us. And that, that one's lovely. 433 Silman. That's just beautiful. <coughs> This is Paul Holland. At yes, it is. Mm -hmm. I think the snow on the shrubs always adds to it, too, doesn't it? You know, it's winter in Michigan. And this is the candy shop. It's at 23337 Woodward. It's a unique little store that everybody should stop in and see what they've got. They've got some lovely things in there. Kind of like an old-fashioned candy store. I believe that's the end.
Once again, I'd like to thank Dell. He was really great to come along and help us. We appreciate it. So I'll read off the winners, and some of them are here to come up and get their certificates tonight. Uh, the first one is John Kennedy at 506 West Maplehurst. Oh, he's, he did make it. He had called today and didn't know if he would be up to coming tonight. He's been sick. So I'm glad you could make it. Yes. Thank you, Mayor. Appreciate it. Thank you. Very much. And the second one is um, Bruce and Sherry Eaton at 1716 Pearson. I, they're here this evening. one is the Myers family at 2448 Bonner. We were out in front of their house a long time. They kept looking out to see who we were and what we were doing. <laughs> Thank you. Great job. And the fourth one is Paul Holland at 433 Silman. I'm glad he was able to make it. Really nice. Thank you. Good job. Good job. You did there. And the last one is the Woodward Avenue Candy Shop, 23337 Woodward. Beautiful little building. It's beautiful inside and out. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, I'd like to thank Dell, and um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming to get their certificate tonight too. Good evening. <laughs> And our thanks, of course, to Peggy Snow and the Beautification Commission. You guys, um, I know you have a lot of fun, but you put a lot of time into it as well. It's appreciated. Thank you. The next item on the agenda, Madam Clerk. We have a presentation by the Downtown Development Authority. Thank you. I see that Chris Hughes is here with us without her trusty laptop, though. Pardon, pardon me? No fancy laptop presentations? Today? Nothing fancy tonight. Well, yes, actually it's fancy, but it's not laptop. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem, Council, everybody else watching at home. That was great, Peggy. Love to see all those bright lights. Um, I'm here tonight representing the Ferndale DDA, the Downtown Development Authority, and I'd like to introduce and immediately pass it over to the woman that was the chairperson of our Holiday Ice Festival, the Warm Hearted Cookie Challenge, which is a very cool fundraiser that we have every year with Holiday Ice. We've raised um, thousands of dollars. She can fill you more in on that over the last couple of years that we've had it, but it's a very nice component of Holiday Ice, brings a lot of people to town, raises awareness of um, the various charities. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Sharon Chess, who is our volunteer chairperson of the Warm Hearted Cookie Challenge. Um, this year, as all years, um, we had nonprofits from the city of Ferndale participate. The Warm Hearted Cookie Challenge, if you're unfamiliar with that, is held the day of our ice festival here downtown. And in Ferndale, we have 120 nonprofits. And what my intention is, is to create a business partnership with some of the nonprofits. And what they are um, encouraged to do is the nonprofits create the partnership. They ask a business owner that they may have um, an association with their familiarity with um, to host the nonprofit. And they bake 12 dozen cookies. And they come up with very creative ways on how to hawk those cookies for funds for that particular nonprofit. And we have come up over the years with some very creative ways to do that. 
and this year, um, probably the best partnership that's been created over the last three years is that with the Candlewick Shop and the David Michael Smith um, Memorial Fund through the Ferndale Youth Association. And they are the epitome of what the intention of the challenge is. And this year, we raised over $2,000 with the 10 nonprofits that participated. Everybody had a great deal of fun. Everybody had a lot of calories to eat that day. Um, you figure that's 10 different cookies that you have to sample as you're going through the downtown area and looking at all the ice sculptures. And this year, the winners are, um, if I could invite Diane and Lloyd Smith up. Um, They raised over $300 for their um, David Michael Smith Memorial Fund. And in addition to that, they're being awarded a $200 check from Chess Roofing and Siding from my husband and myself. And congratulations. Thank you. And in addition to that, they get a trophy to display, um, most likely in the Ferndale Youth Assistance Office. And this trophy was created by Chris from the Downtown Development Association last year. Um, it's quite creative. <laughs> so, on behalf of the Warm Hearted Cookie Challenge, we look forward to having you next year defending the trophy um, and years after that. So, congratulations. <laughs> Anything else from the Downtown Development Authority, or is that it? Okay, thank you, Chris. And our next item. Okay, we have a presentation from the Ferndale Financial Planning Committee uh, presenting the end results of their many, many months of work. Thank you. This is a this is a big one tonight. Um, and just before the committee gets started, I've talked with um, both the um, committee co-chair and the city manager. Um, about how we should, you know, sort of think about this presentation. So just to share that, the this tonight is the committee's time to present their findings and their recommendations to the council. We've not yet received their written recommendation. I understand that they've just wrapped it up, put the final touches on it today, the final edits. Um, so what we'll see tonight is an overview. Um, this is sort of their executive summary um, for the community of what is in what I understand is a fairly extensive written report. Um, both the report and this presentation will be available online once the council accepts them, so later on this week. After the presentation, the council will ask questions of the committee. And I would like to then, after that, and I've talked with, with Co-Chair Porter, and, and he was comfortable with this as well, set aside about a half an hour at the end of the presentation. We don't generally do that at presentations, but I imagine there are some people here who weren't able to attend the public forum that was held a little over a week ago. Um, so if any of those folks have questions for the committee, I'd like to give them priority in asking them, but we will set aside a little bit of time after the presentation for questions. Um, also, just so that folks know, uh, there will be uh, another informal presentation tomorrow to the Ferndale Seniors at the Kulik Center, I believe at 11 o'clock. Wednesday. Wednesday, thank you. Apologies. Wednesday at the Kulik Center at 11 a.m. Thank you, Katie. Um, and the council will also be talking about this again um, at our next meeting on the 24th. So take it and, away. Uh, thank you. And it's uh, our mayor approach. I mean, it's nice. I uh, haven't seen. Uh, a young lady sitting in that chair since an old friend Pam McCullough was there. Mm -hmm. um, so congratulations. Thank uh, you. The committee uh, worked tirelessly. Some of these people gave away vacations in order to get the amount of information they had to go through to get this done. Um, we actually completed this this afternoon, as you'd indicated. Uh, some of the basic slide program that was done for a public hearing um, and the final document are not the same. So we're going to try and wing it a little bit, and we may do a little free form. I may refer to somebody, uh, a member of the committee, and uh, Sharon didn't bring cookies, by the way. <laughs> uh, 
These were the revenue forecasts, as you can plainly see. The 2010 forecast was based on the following countywide tables, and there's some good news in this. Um, a 12 percent drop in property values in 2012, 5 percent in 2013, and 2.5 percent in 2005. Uh, since then, uh, partly because of the good work Council has been doing and the desirability of the City of Ferndale, we haven't had the drop quite as dramatic as some of the others. And uh, it looks like 6.41 percent, 2.67, and 1.34 over the next three years for us. The property value forecast is showing the uh, increment where things have been at this point and where they're going. You can see that uh, we've, we've actually tried to follow the numbers from 2000 all the way up through the projected times um, because there were some slumps and so forth back in the early days and how they were dealt with. Uh, council actually, I believe there's a slide further on, um, has actually been below in what they've spent as compared to revenue. So basically, they've done a good job of trying to balance the finances of the city over the past few years. State revenue sharing has been a dramatic problem for the city. Um, going back, and we, uh, do we have the chart on that? There we go. Uh, as you can see from the chart, uh, the state revenue sharing, which was somewhat of a promise when proposal A went through, um, has dropped. Uh, millions of dollars since the original time, and we're projecting that it'll drop down to the minimum of 1.4 million, which is um, constitutional revenue sharing. The other revenue sharing that was above that was called statutory, and the state had the right to adjust that. The general revenue forecasts coming up through the next three years is. <coughs> Did you have the numbers on that or the chart on that? As you can see, the revenue forecast coming up to 2010 um, all looks fine, well, and good. But the projections based on the current trends show a drop that take us back to the figures that were approximately 2001. The expenditure forecasts, as we've reviewed, as you see, there was a slight increase back in the early 2000-2001, but cost-cutting measures went in place, and uh, we actually kept the budget fairly low. Straight line is what is in the middle, indicating what the standard was at that time. Uh, we peaked slightly above that point, but as you can see, the uh, expenditures are dropping dramatically based on what's been done currently by Council and the anticipated future budgets. The, co uh, the committee was actually charged with reviewing the expenditures, the costs, and come up with the best possible solution that we felt uh, was appropriate for our city. Uh, the committee's taken, as it says up there, over 14 weeks, but not only were the regular meetings, those actually extended for many, many hours, but the people on the committee spent time uh, research uh, back and forth with each other and phone calls and so forth, trying to find all of the particular things that would weigh us down from a financial end and what we had to do from a revenue side to reach a balance, something that balanced our community but kept the city viable. Now, the tax collection, taxes collected in, in July of 2010 will fund the city operations for July, from July 1, 2010 to July 30, 2011. But as you know up there, but many people don't understand, that they reflect values of properties back in 2008. There's actually a lag time from the time that properties are evaluated to the time that taxes are collected on those values. We're just starting to see, as you all well know, the hardest hit or drop from when that started to change, when the curve changed. Cost cuts and, and operational improvements, and uh, give me a section here, and I'm going to pull this up for you. But the, uh, there's been some dramatic changes, actually, that the city has done uh, currently. In an effort to reduce expenses in the past 12 months, the city has seen a 28% reduction in staff, 
the reorganization of workflow and responsibilities, new software programs, and the renovation of city halls to enhance efficiency. The committee commends the city for these actions and encourages them to continue to implement their plan of achieving maximum benefits from the changes that they've made. Um, all of those listed staff reductions and some of the things we might touch on further in here as we look at the budget to the future and reduction of operating hours and of course the software. Um, some of those actions that were done recently of course included um, police layoffs, some fire layoffs, general staff reductions in all departments and cross training in order to make people more efficient as far as financial operations in city government. It gets a little scary when you start to look at some of the graphs. The annual projected deficit, if you look at it, continues to lay across in the area of about $5 million a year. When you look at the accumulated deficit at the end of 2016, the potential is roughly $23 million. Now, when you put that in perspective, the city operates a budget of somewhere in the area of 18 to $19 million. That's negative ground. Just a brief outline of, of what the anticipated decline in property values are. And as we indicated before, there is a lag, so you're going to see those numbers where they get more dramatic as we get up toward 2016 are really more reflectant of this year and next year and the year after. What the committee did is when they tried to determine what the right thing to do for the city was, <coughs> I mean, you can always say cut and raise money. But in order to make that sustainable, we had to look at short-term goals, mid-term goals, and long-term goals so that this was something that was sustainable into the future. Three possibilities that we had. They had the override millage, dedicated, dedicated public safety millage, and then, of course, we did a scenario if no millage is passed whatsoever. Um, as you can see on the bottom, further cost cuts were required under any of the three options. Now, as, we're, as you know, we're limited to 20 mills. The city's general millage rate was permanently reduced from 20 mills down to 14.544. I believe back around 2000, we were up close to the 20, I think 19 and a half. Um, the rollback in for, oh, what was it? Uh, by Headley Rollback in Ferndale year 2007, and it has been the 14.5448 mills ever since then, um, simply because there hasn't been growth. A Headley override would allow the city to levy a maximum of the 20 mills uh, at the council's discretion. What we tried to illustrate here is, I believe we went, uh, 50,000 was that, or 40,000? This was a $40,000 assessed value property, and it shows the taxes on that home in 2007, 8, 9, and progressing forward. The green line that extends out is the tax that would be paid on that home if the extensions that we're recommending to you are followed. That would be a Headley override. The red line indicates what the inc uh, income of the city would be if we do not. With the Headley override, we still have recommendations of reductions in public safety expenses of $750,000, uh, two or three year wage freeze for union and non-union employees, uh, consideration of further consolidation of department heads if feasible and, and determined by council, and ensure the utilization of all of the new softwares and efficiencies in City Hall to continue to maintain reduced operating costs. Some of the short term cuts in revenues were fire department, there's some staff changes and so forth that we've detailed more in the reports, along with the police department, <coughs> some possibilities of assessing uh, revenue opportunities there. Uh, that actually includes increased staffing, but it's something that council should consider in the future. Um, fee management simply was just making sure that council reviews yearly the cost of our fees to make sure that we're claiming back all the dollars that it costs us to perform services. Some of the things that were also talked about in the committee, um, DPW tree planting, uh, this was a question as to whether or not the city could still buy in bulk and sell and install trees for people 
at a profit. This was not a cost-cutting item. Uh, the sidewalk program, uh, because of the cost, temporary suspension until council felt they were fluid enough, again, to implement the program. Dream Cruise and special events, what they're talking about is just making sure that we reclaim all of our costs for the events that we run in the city for the DPW and, and the other uh, the police officers and other people that participate. And also uh, questions came forward as to whether or not some of those events may not be able to yield a little bit more profit. The Coolidge Center, uh, rentals and fees, there's discussion in the report as to how we can possibly expand the operation of the Coolidge Center. When we're talking about fees and rentals, we're not saying drive the, drive the rates up so kids can't afford to play softball or anything. but we have a facility that with some with some promotion and possibly changes, I know this came before council before as to whether or not maybe beer and wine should be allowed for events and so forth and so on. We feel some of those things should be investigated to see if we can actually cover some of our costs with the rentals and, and improved usage of the community center. The freeze in hiring consultants. Uh, obviously, in the last couple of years with some major projects uh, on, on the board, there's been some fairly expensive costs as far as consultants are concerned. There's some points in the uh, report that uh, talk about different groups that can, as well as working better in our community. We have a very, very talented community from engineering to attorneys and so forth, and, and possibly eliminating some of those costs. We do understand that there are certain things and certain specialties and expertise that you just need to call in someone for. Midterm, and this is a brief synopsis, but to, to encourage the, the public-private partnerships, whether it's possibly um, leasing park names to company groups and so forth, um, or private corporations being able to perform some services that are just a little too expensive or out of reach for us to do as a city. Um, consideration, uh, considering the uh, master plan and reviewing, when we drew our last master plan, it was based on wants and needs at that time and the financial situation that we were facing. Uh, today, those things are different. And one of the things we may want to do is look at that and make some determinations if if we need to shift those goals a little bit into the future for a cost-cutting measure. So some of the long-term and core cuts revenue to, uh, and revenue increases, uh, regionalization in public safety is one of the considerations, uh, explore opportunities uh, in the auto parking fund. Will, will working with the DDA, for example, and promoting something new in parking such as the deck getting somebody to finance, whatever the case may be. Can that enhance revenues to the city overall? Those things need to be explored. The regionalization issue, you know, it's something I remember in my day, we started with the Ferndale, Hazel Park, Royal Oak, Madison Heights, kind of working on a consolidation of fire services there. Uh, the police department, uh, I believe my kitchen started 10 or 11 years ago, uh, working on a centralized dispatch system and so forth and so on. And many communities were doing those types of things and it was kind of feel good. Today, the urgency changes that and we think it's really critical that council keeps that on the front burner, looking to drive some of those consolidations to cut costs for the future. The millage scenario, just to point out that the different things that we actually looked at. Um, a is referring to a dedicated public safety millage of five mills. Now, as you know on council, what that would do, that would take five mills that would be dedicated, that's roughly two and a half to three million dollars, depending on where the property values are at that time, that would be dedicated to public safety. However, that would not drive those departments. Uh, the balance still would come out of the general fund, and still some major cuts would have to be made at that level. Option B was a 10-year millage uh, solely for public safety. That would, again, isolating that 10 mills in that point, approximately $5 million. Again, not covering the cost of public safety. And that would be balanced by funds from the general fund. Now, with that, that would include council rolling back their millage if there was any other excess of the city's general fund millage. Um, but the reason that was really thrown out was when we looked at the dollars involved, that's just not feasible in today's economic times for people to support something of that nature. Um, as I'd indicated, further cuts would be required under Proposal A. 
and of course the millage rate and the cost of running government would continue to increase because if we did the 10 mil or proposal B on a dedicated millage, um, that would tend to make the city flush with cash in a time when people would be paying more and the economy was dropping and uh, create somewhat of an unstable situation where no cuts would be made, city government would get smaller, and when the crash came down even further, uh, we'd be in a terrible situation. And with that kind of millage out there, there's no options. Come on up. This is Scott Helmer. He's our graph man right here. Yeah, well, it, we, we had a lot of folks working on this, and we should probably cite council today's probably seen some of these slides, which came from Mr. Bruner. What we did here was create a chart that just illustrates a step up in the millage rate. We're at 48 today. If we get a, some level of millage, the recommendation is for the Headley, we'd, we'd go up approximately 5 mils to 53. Um, one of the requests was to show a millage increasing if we were to maintain current service levels, how much would we require in additional taxes. And the purpose of this chart is to illustrate that without further cuts and generally a reduction in the cost of running city government, uh, you could theoretically end up with a, a, a requirement to have a, a 60 mil rate uh, homesteaded to just run city government at the current cost structure. As you, as you know, that would take us to roughly 26.5 mils, and under state law, 20 mils is maximum. The last, uh, last item we looked at, of course, was what happens if, if no millage is passed whatsoever. Um, Eighteen to twenty-four thousand dollars worth of cumulative debt over the first five years. Um, council would be forced to take drastic measures, and in the report to you, we've outlined uh, some of the things that we'd be talking about, such as loss of major departments, loss of maintaining parks and recreation, most likely outsourcing our public safety services, and so forth. But you'll see the detail in the file. Now, the Headley override scenario and, and why we recommended it. First, we keep the majority of services at relatively similar operating levels. Uh, it's the least millage impact on property owners. Uh, but with that, we added a couple of things, one being a sunset clause. Uh, the reason for a sunset clause, there's really a couple of reasons behind that. Uh, one, um, it forces, I believe, our administrators in our city and our council to be cost effective in their budgeting. Uh, this isn't going to go on forever. Um, also, in December 31st of 2015, we have debt bonds that fall off. At that point, uh, we'll have a reduction, roughly it's estimated at 7 to 7.2 mils by that point in time, that will actually be coming off of our debt load as far as our taxes in the city. Um, if everything is fine, if property values are stabilized and council is able to balance the budget at that time on the revenues that they can glean from taxes and, and state revenue sharing and so forth, then both would go and the city would get a roughly 12, 11, 12, 13 mil reduction in their taxes. If not, if the situation was still unstable, um, obviously it is much simpler for our community to deal with a mill, a two, a three, whatever that happens to be, uh, if it's actually going to be a reduction in their taxes overall. So we thought that that was the appropriate time for you to review this in the future. And that concludes your presentation, Co-Chair Porter? That's got it. The one thing that I, I, uh, that I either skipped over um, because I was trying to look. The pages on that don't match the pages on this, by the way. Um, was the fact that the recommendation to council includes um, the Headley override to a maximum of the 20 mils, but restricts our recommendation, council's choice, of course. Our recommendation restricts that based on the updated property values and the stability that so far is hanging in Ferndale to three mills. After that point in time, you, excuse me, clarify, you would go for the entire millage. Three mills the first year, 
that may be sustainable if current projections hold and we haven't taken people to the maximum. Um, there's no way to guarantee that. Projections are simply that, projections. And council would then have the flexibility over the next four years to either go up or if things happen to work our way, go down on that millage. Thank you. I will open it up now for questions from the council. Should we direct questions to you, Chairman Porter, or will you sort of designate the committee member that worked in that? If this is on, can I take this back to the... I'm sure Dell can turn it on if it's not on. I know that different committee members worked on different segments of the report, so... Exactly. Thank you. All right, do council members have questions for the committee? I have a couple, but I'll let you guys get started. Uh, on the uh, projected revenue um, changes as a result of the uh, Headley override and the increase in the tax levy, uh, what is your projection of the average, in, the increase in the average homeowner's uh, assessment with a three mil as opposed to a five mil levy increase? Yeah, hi, Councilman Galloway. Well, uh, th there is a spreadsheet that's listed as attachment B in the formal report. Uh, there was only so much we could present on the PowerPoint slide today. Uh, at a five mil rate, given an average estimated uh, homeowner and taxable value of approximately 40000 which equates to about an $80,000 assessed value, we were looking at a $218 increase for that average homeowner. Uh, if we were to limit to three mills, it's about 60% of that, so approximately $130, call it. Uh, so, you know, we're looking at somewhere in the range of uh, $12 to $20 a month uh, for the average homeowner. Okay, 50 cents to a dollar a day to maintain the current uh, service levels based on your projections? That, that's short term. Again, we, we think the Headley gives you an ability uh, to, to cover the projected deficit for next year and then to work on some of the efforts that have already been put in place, uh, all of the streamlining, ongoing negotiations on uh, contracts for city workers, things of that nature. Um, but regardless of any scenario uh, that we looked at, including the Headley, there will be a requirement for additional cuts, uh, depending, these are projections as Mr. Porter cited. Things could, our taxable values could end up a little bit better. We're using worst case analysis, which might be prudent today. But if taxable values stabilize, uh, that could have a positive impact. Uh, if state revenue sharing isn't cut as dramatically, you know, we've had at least two sets of revisions to the numbers we looked at during this process for three to four months. And uh, my second question, I'm not sure who's best uh, to direct this to, but uh, you suggest changes to the master plan uh, to reflect current financial condition. What exactly did you mean by that? When we reviewed the master plan, there were, um, looking in different departments, the priorities. Some of the priorities in the master plan were focused on different street improvements. Um, I don't have them memorized exactly, but I think that with the changing financial situation in Ferndale and, and getting a little more conservative on how we're looking at spending the money, um, looking at the master plan and resetting your vision. Because that looks like the master plan, and from talking to council members and from reading the master plan, um, this is what drives your decisions. So revisiting that to say, what is our priority? What is the purpose of the local government here in Ferndale? Because that's something that's determined by the will of the people, and the will of the people elected our council members and our mayor soon. So um, to, to look at that again. If I, if I can, Scott, here, here's a brief sentence or a brief paragraph out of there. Uh, Ferndale's land use master plan reflects what was valued by its voters in 2008, but in 2011, many of those services are no longer affordable at the current revenue levels or cost structure. When looking at local government, one must evaluate and balance what are needs and what are wants. No one wants to decrease the quality of services, civic or public safety as this could lead further deterioration of our property values and desirability of the community. And however, excessive tax increases can have exactly the same effect. And we were kind of using that to 
one of the levers on that because in order to make the city viable and still financially uh, strong, there has to be a balance between that. Well, did you identify some area of the master plan that you think was uh, adversely affecting our budget? Oh, Jackie's. Um, I wish I had it in front of me at this moment um, because there was, I think that needs additional review, and that's kind of where we left it, is that it, it, it had needs additional review to determine what our needs and what our wants in this changing financial climate. And um, I did not have specifics that I outlined within the master plan, but looking at that going, well, that, that doesn't fit um, the, the financial crisis that we're looking at today. It's just, it's really the overall, this doesn't exactly fit, so there needs to be, to be a, a review of that. That, as I said, I, I read it, I didn't read it minutely. I did an overview when I looked at the different priorities because that's a, that's a long-term commitment to sit down and read the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So as I was looking at that and looking at the different budgets from different cities um, and doing some comparison, I just felt that, that there is a shift um, that, that needs to be reflected in the master, master plan. Okay. Councilman Lennon has a question. Once just kind of a little bit follow-up, Jackie, on that. Are you talking about redoing the entire master plan or taking it on a case-by-case -case scenario? I think a, a review, I'm not saying to reset and have a new consultant come in and rewrite the whole thing, just taking a new review of it and being mindful of the fact that the master plan may have to shift. There were some development things in there that were uh, investments in the, from the city of Ferndale, and there were a few things in there that, that is what made me say, I think we need to review this. Now, I started reviewing the master plan when... Um, we got to, in the financial committee, we got to the point of what exactly is our charge and what exactly are we supposed to do in the financial committee. And I went off on a tangent saying, what is the purpose of local government? And I did a lot of digging on that. And I, that, that was a, something I don't ever want to repeat. I know more about that now than I ever wanted to in my life. <laughs> um, but that's when I referred to the master plan to give me guidance and um, to give me guidance as to what the city of Ferndale wants to do. And, and so many of those things, things seem to shift. Things that were lower on the list became more of a priority because they're more of a need than a want. I, I think I did point out that the master plan is generally a five-year reviewable document anyway, and, that we, and that's something we will be coming up to look at and review. Um, I think you're feeling in Mike's uh, question, I think her feeling was more on a case-by-case -case basis. There are, there are some things that are structured in such a way that may encourage, let me say, um, ABC development that just isn't appropriate in today's economy, and we may be able to do better down here with uh, CDE's type of development or something of that nature. She just felt that there was a way to look at that flexibility and possible development as well. I agree. Thanks. Not to harp on it, but you have three land use people up here. So um, just um, when it comes to master plan documents, these are these are tenure documents, and there should be some wants in your master plan. There should be some aspirations in your master plan. This is the land use future of your city and the way that land use can impact future development. Um, so I'm, I'm going to think about, you know, how or, how or if, the Planning Commission should address this. I'm the Planning Commission liaison, so I'll take this question to our February meeting. We're not meeting in January. Um, but just so that the audience knows, um, it was a, that master plan was a long time coming. There was um, consultant involvement at the front end of it many years ago, um, but the document was ultimately written almost entirely by a volunteer group very similar to the, the group that you guys are members of right now. The Planning Commission um, wrote the vast majority of the master plan and redid the entire zoning ordinance. Um, as a volunteer committee, so it's um, it, we are we are blessed with with great volunteers in Ferndale, um, and I will talk to them in February about your recommendations. Councilwoman Piana, do you have any questions? Well, I had similar questions about the master plan, but I think we've uh, touched we on every on yeah. no, I, yeah. Um, but I do agree with uh, a review of uh, priorities um, and implementation schedule. Um, a lot of our implementation schedules are ongoing, which are, you know, like infinity and beyond. So, um, which no real strategies to tie in with on an annual basis with, with 
council priorities. So I think there is stronger connections to be made. With that said, I wanted to start off by saying thank you to the Financial Planning Committee, the amount of hours that you have put into this um, to come up with a recommendation on how does the city, um, how should the city deal with these financial, these um, difficult financial decisions. And I want to remind people that the Financial Planning Committee was chosen by council to take the pulse of the residents about what the residents would be willing to support in terms of helping solve this issue. And it really does require revenue increases if we want to maintain um, investing in Ferndale and maintaining those services. So we chose the Financial Planning Committee direction versus I believe it was $16,000 to do a cobalt phone survey of residents. So we chose this option instead of that one. So if we followed your advice of not using consultants, we went that route. So, um, <laughs> so I wanted to remind people of that. Um, I, I am interested in hearing a little bit more about your public public-private partnerships, as this is a new strategy not only for local communities, county government, but it also is something that the state of Michigan is looking at. And I was wondering if you had specific recommendations outside of park maintenance with corporations um, in terms of doing public-private partnerships. I'm going to hand this off. Uh, do you want to talk about that? But uh, I, I did want to state, and this is even to the question of the master plan recommendation, uh, one of our ideas and recommendations was to, in, in the long term, for council and city government to promote uh, development under the master plan. If you get new development, that generates new tax revenue. So I, I don't know that there, there was a uh, desire of the committee that this master plan be scrapped and, and completely rewritten. It was more that uh, in, in a new era, I think people are thinking more about the city um, practices, whether we're investing in um, cultural projects, art, that continue to come up on the public. And the numbers may not be large, but I think there's a perspective that in total they add up. If, this, if the city government any given year gives $25,000 here or hires a consultant, we did continue to hear that from the public. But in the same way, we think obviously there needs to be uh, ongoing investment in the community and whatever the city can do to raise property tax revenues, they should do. Uh, so that spreadsheet attachment, and I think it's important to clarify this, these are all just recommendations and they're sort of like placeholders. There's a need to cut costs and to raise revenues. Uh, so, so this 30-page recommendation includes many ideas, as Jackie said, that need further research and exploration, and we'll, we'll leave the details up to council and to the department heads uh, to, to, to research further. As for public-private partnerships, that falls in under the category of something that uh, was, was discussed as a possibility for raising money, whether it be, um, you know, I, I think one of the recommendations was possibly private sponsorship of a park. Uh, if there's a parking garage, I know a number of years ago there was a discussion for an RFP of maybe a public-private relationship to get apartments above a city-owned parking garage. So I think that's what we were discussing. It's any way to, um, um, to leverage and help city government promote an increase in revenues. So is the thought there, I mean, we have a very small, we have two uh, very small R4 districts in the city that create very dense uh, land use, both uh, Withington West and Autumn Towers. I mean, is the suggestion to perhaps expand the R4 district or the R3 district, um, allow greater densities in residential settings? Or? We, we did not get into that in any specificity. It was really more about uh, the, the ongoing public comments for the city to review uh, what it was investing in. So it was actually not, not probably as specific to the types of development the city supported. But, you know, there's a need to increase tax revenue. One of the ways you do that is to allow for development. The city's fully built out. That's one of the challenges we face. In fact, we're a very old city. Uh, we cite in the report that the average house size in Ferndale is quite a bit smaller than that in some of the outlying suburbs uh, and even some of our nearby neighbors. So that's one of the challenges we have. Older housing stock, smaller average houses. Uh, so if you can promote development and get an apartment building, that could have a pretty strong positive effect in raising tax revenues long term. Well, I, I mean, I guess we could go on discussing this, but I think it's important to hear what people have to say. And I think um, I've always talked about it, even in my campaign, about um, making sure that our city services are strong where we can, um, making sure we have a strong 
economic development strategy for the city, and, um, and we are retooling our community services department to have a stronger economic development focus, and we're rehiring that position this month. Um, and uh, making sure we have a quality of life, because you, you can't cut our costs and solve this problem. Um, you need all three to make sure that you're moving ahead, shoring up what you have. And, and so I think that's what I see. And um, some of these economic development strategies um, would go away, like the DDA. I've always um, have, I have always believed, and maybe even not said publicly, some cities don't need DDAs. Some cities um, may not have the right skill sets to have the DDA managed. And DDA may <coughs> show a return on investment. And I think our DDA definitely shows a return on investment. And I think it would do a disservice and a disinvestment in our community if this, some of these things would be reduced or eliminated out of our, our strategies. And so um, I just am really just appreciative of how you guys taken all of the, how your committee has taken all this in con, into consideration. I think one of the things that was discussed when, that, when they were talking about those things, a few years ago there was a tentative proposal on the sidelines, for example, for a private individual to build a new building across the street that would actually lease space back to the court so that the major capital investment didn't come out of the city funds and so forth. Those are some of the types of things, creative mm -hmm. financial development arrangements, um, as well as selling other little things, as she had indicated. She's our business owner and manufacturing person from the city here. Um, and so she looked at the little odds and ends, at how she could promote and gain more funds on this item and this item. And some of those things are things that we can do as a city as well. I have a question on slide number 20 in the presentation you showed tonight, not the one that was in the council packet. Um, you talked about how, or you, you talked a bit about the process um, that the city council and the residents would need to go through in order to um, achieve a, a Headley override millage. And I wondered if you, or this may actually be a question for the, for the city manager, could talk a little bit more about that process because there was a statement that said something about taxes being levied at the council's discretion and I think that could be confusing to some people. I, I know what you meant, um, it, which was the council would need to authorize language to get it on the ballot. But I, I, I wanted to see if, if um, there was a little more explanation. What we're simply saying at this point that we are a recommending body to you, and we are recommending that, that on the ballot that 20 mils is the safety. That's the safety lever that you need in today's economy. And that's why we restricted on the first year, or we're asking you to restrict to three mills. We feel if the stability of property values in the city hold as the most recent projections come out, you'll be able to survive at that level, and the community will be able to be in much better condition. I mean, there's a lot of people that have great concerns about tax increases. Minimizing, minimizing a headley to three mills, if we can do that and maintain our budget for the first year, see how it goes. But by approving the entire 20 mil budget, you in the future have that flexibility. Um, property values drop 4% more than the last projection, then you can implement, as for example, Huntington Woods. Huntington Woods approved a 20 mil override I believe four years ago, five years ago now. It still isn't fully implemented. They've been using quarters and halves uh, year to year in order to keep their budget sustained, and that's kind of what we were looking at. But those decisions come after a vote of the residents, is what I was getting at. Oh, no question. Those, uh, you know, I mean, council would place on the ballot what it felt was appropriate, whether it's our recommendation or there's something else that you believe is more appropriate. Um, if the residents don't support that, it's start over time and we're in trouble. If the residents do support that, at that point you will have to go back, um, you know, make the decision as council and go back if you want to lift anything any further on a year to year basis. So you'll have the approval up to 20 mils to levy that tax. You'll have that flexibility. One of the, um, I thank you, I, I wanted to clarify to make people, make sure that people understood that the council would not be increasing their taxes without their knowledge. That was something I wanted to make very clear. So I, I'm I said I wanted to make sure that we were very clear that people understood that the council would not be increasing their taxes without their knowledge. There will be a, a public vote on 
the recommendations that are coming out of this body tonight. No question. And one of the things that we've talked about um, as a council and with our city manager and with the gentleman who will likely become our interim city manager is that because of the timing of this, um, this conversation and this potential vote, the council and the city staff will need to prepare two, if not more, um, different budget scenarios. We will not know until after, about two weeks after we have to officially pass the city's budget for next year, whether or not a millage is approved. So as we go through this budget process, I think it will become clearer and clearer um, where some of these potential new um, cuts will come from. Um, I think we will have some very black and white numbers um, to show our residents to keep them informed of, just like you laid out option A and option B. Um, Greg Pollack, I'm on the committee, and um, in addition to the recommendation of the Headley override, we're suggesting that council also create a uh, citizen advisory committee to oversee how the money is spent um, and make sure that council isn't going with the four mills in the first year as opposed to three mills um, or in the second year going all the way up to 5.4. Making sure that we're that council is including the cuts and recommendations that the committee is suggesting um, as well. So we're encouraging that to be part of um, the override if council uh, so employs it. I think that's an important part of every citizen's job. Democracy, if, if I can, too. Point taken. Um, we understood completely what your circumstance was because the committee would formulate numbers and then certain projections would change. It was a very abstract situation for us and I think there's um, been many adjustments made over there. At first it almost looked like a hopeless scenario, um, but I think the numbers that are up there today are fairly accurate. But you're right, the public has to know that no taxes can be changed, one, unless council creates something, places it on the ballot and they make the approval. Exactly what I was Other questions from the council? Mike? No, I'll wait for the report. All right, well, let me take a look at the time here. It's about 8.38, and as I said, um, we will open this up for some brief questions to the committee um, from members of the public. If people are here tonight to ask questions, I would ask uh, that we give priority to people who were not able to attend uh, the public hearing that was held what, a week or so ago. So if anyone does have questions, you are free to approach the podium at this time. Please either sign in in back or state your name and address for the record for our city clerk. Come on up. Come on up. Kay Watson. Um, now, I don't know where to start. You've raised so many other issues, but one thing that concerns me about the Headley override that I mentioned to the former Mayor Porter was right now there are some people that are about to lose their homes. With the Headley override, they could very well lose it, which would defeat the purpose of why you're wanting to override it in the first place. Uh, they keep talking about keeping our community viable, that people want to come here. I don't know where all these people are because all the people are having the same problem in other communities, so I don't see any stampede here. A lot of recommendations were made at one of the meetings by Sean House, too, uh, which they let him speak for a few minutes, and they did tell him that some of these issues they had addressed. Uh, he was cut short, but something I do want to point out is uh, I don't know that this financial committee even paid any attention to it, but there was a man, a deputy, hang on, a deputy county executive named Bob Dadow. In fact, you're supposed to be able to pull up this issue on Mackinac website. He had a presentation that overwhelmed me, and that's why I can't believe I haven't heard anything. It's called The Perfect Storm, and we are facing it now. So while we want, to, we want to pay taxes, or we don't want to pay taxes, we want to pay our bills, we keep making bad decisions on things that we can't afford. 
Now, I heard somebody mention about this auto garage, the parking thing, which could bring in money, but that's a projection. How many times have we had the auto industry say they projected so much that they're going to make and then claim a loss? They didn't lose it. They just didn't come through with what they projected. We, we cannot afford to be iffy, expecting, because everybody's having financial problems. In fact, the news the other day said that for the next five years, we're not going to see a change in employment. We have a housing bubble. Real estate's going to be affected for five years, so we cannot think of spending more when we cannot dig out of the hole we're in now. Do you have a question for the committee? When, uh, I think it was uh, Mr. Porter when you asked if um, council would be, if uh, the citizens would be knowledgeable of an increase, and you said yes. Will we know beforehand or after the fact? What I was clarifying with, with former Mayor Porter was that the citizens would have the right and the responsibility to vote on any proposed millage increase. But will the amount be stated exactly, not just we want to know before we sign on the dotted lines? I haven't, <laughs> I haven't run a millage proposal in the past, so I'm looking at the city attorney who's nodding his head that, yes, that's exactly what would be spelled out in ballot language. Is that correct? Is that the way we did it? Uh, through the chair, that is correct. The, the, the there's no resolution that's been prepared, uh, mm -hmm. but, but uh, any type of resolution would identify uh, the number of proposed mills and what the uh, proposed uh, revenue that those mills would generate would be. And I believe there will be more discussion on that exact topic at our meeting on the okay. 24th. Also, when we're wanting to increase revenue, uh, we make all these regulations for the city, but they're not enforced. If we would enforce the laws we make, we could have some revenue. Now, I know people are supposed to keep their walks shoveled. In fact, our mailman has refused to deliver mail in places because he said the post office told them, you don't go there, you might fall, and it's a claim against them. Um, we have, we, do we still have code enforcement? We do. It, it is a reduced staff, but we do. Well, when they drive by and see things like this, they could report it to the proper department and see that's taken care of. Thank you. Were there any other questions for the committee? No, I think that's all right now. Thank you. Thank you. If I can, uh, in response, and, and thank you. Here is a copy. These are just of some resolutions that were on ballots in other communities, so you can see what information you'd have to be would have to be available to you. Um, when she talked about the enforcement of the sidewalks and so forth, that's one of the things that we were talking about that council had done well in initiating its new programs, new computer system and cross training is so that we more effectively manage those items and collect fees that may result from that. Mm -hmm. exactly. I don't see anyone running to the podium. So even if people have asked questions in the past, are there any other questions for the committee at this time? All right, not seeing any. I would like to extend my personal thanks, my very, very sincere thanks. This committee has gone through a process um, absolutely as in-depth, if not more so, than our very lengthy budget process last year. Um, and you have come up to speed in an amazing fashion on a variety of things. I am so excited that someone actually read the master plan. <laughs> for, for a planning nerd, that's, that's fantastic. And I challenge you to read the zoning ordinance. Uh, that's the next one I'll go through with you. Um, so thank you very, very much. I look forward to reading your written report, which I know a great deal of work went into. I know that you have been working on that particular document for weeks. Um, and I'm glad that we've heard from a number of the committee members tonight. There are, are, there are some, I could look at one right now, who refused to get up and share their opinions, although I know that they were very vocal in the meetings. And I thank you for that. We had a great representation of people. We had bankers and accountants to small business owners to people who work in the auto industry, to a couple of people who are currently unemployed. We really tried to bring together people of all different financial backgrounds and who lived in different areas of the city so that we could get a representation of, of how the city of Ferndale felt. So thank you very, very much. Uh, in closing, we just wanted to reiterate, and I think Bob probably wants to say a couple of words. You know, we, we wanted to applaud council, and you know, the city of Ferndale has continued to improve over the years. There are a lot of good things happening in the city. There's some indications the national economy is improving. We're hoping that some of these projections maybe end up a bit better than uh, w w where they show today. Uh, we did implement uh, 
sort of a short uh, near-term, mid-term, and a long-term approach. So some of these things are, are things that are already ongoing, and maybe there's some new ideas of efforts that council can embrace for the long term. <laughs> Nobody assumes that you can get a new apartment building built tomorrow, but you know we can't expect that the economy is going to last forever, so let's hope uh, we, we maintain some of these long-term efforts um, to, to continue to improve the city. And we, we did the, the, the public meetings, and we had a number of folks, including Kay, that showed up and had some good ideas. So some of that, a lot of that is in the report, and hopefully you'll find that useful. And I think lastly, we need to, we need to thank uh, so many different people, um, from police chiefs <laughs> to the union leaders on the other side and so forth, fire department, other department heads and so forth, uh, that came in because we kind of grilled them with how you can why can't you cut this and why can't you do this and so forth and so on. Uh, and very openly, they were willing to offer any opportunities where they felt that they could push a few more dollars in or save a few more dollars. And, uh, uh, you know, they put themselves out there at a, at a public meeting of this type of nature to make statements like that. So we want to commend them and all of the other folks that came forward with their ideas. It's, uh, it's a pretty taxing situation, and we thank them for their bravery. <laughs> No pun intended, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman Porter, Co-Chairman Porter. Joel Petrie was also, I know, a driving force behind this. All right, so we will move on to our next agenda item then, City Clerk. That brings us to call to audience, Your Honor. Oh, my first call to audience. I don't know that I have the spiel down as well as, as uh, Mayor Covey did, but the call to audience is a half hour period that we set aside generally at the beginning of each meeting. We're about we're a little over an hour in this time um, for residents and other concerned citizens or business owners to speak on any topic on their mind that is not on the agenda. We allot three minutes per speaker. And again, we ask that you either sign in in back or state your name uh, when you come up to the podium for our city clerk's records. Good evening, Sherry Wells, 315 West Troy. I'm one of the fortunate homeowners who is in that special area that is getting these energy audits. And anyone who has not signed up for one is really missing a good deal. Uh, I've used Curly Q light bulbs so long that one of them finally burned out. I've put the foam behind my outlets 20 years ago. I've done lots of stuff, and I learned so much more between the Green Tuesday meeting a couple months before that, that they had things that you could do. And just watching these three men work for four hours in my house, and there's places in my house I can walk by and I'm not feeling the draft I used to feel. And they, one of them was a particularly good teacher and showed me and told me different things I can do. There's a, there's a dormer I'm trying to finish off, and he told me, what it's still not too late for me to try to do on that. Uh, they were just excellent. It was well worth that four hours, and you're really going to miss out if you think that you can just pass that by if you're in that area that Councilwoman Baker and I are in. Uh, so I think it's, it's uh, Woodward to Pinecrest, Nine Mile to... Leroy. To where? Leroy or Pearson? Pearson. Pearson. To, to Pearson. Uh, so I don't have the number handy to call... Uh, but they have been contacting all of us and return their call. It's very, very well worth it. And especially if we're talking about money, there's no reason to try to warm up Mother Nature. I know that the information is on the Michigan Suburbs Alliance website as part of the Regional Energy Office. So people can Google that. <coughs> Any other speakers at the call to audience for anything not on the agenda this evening? Welcome. Good evening, Council. Uh, Ms. Baker, welcome. Mayor Pro Tem to the gavel point and, and chairing the meetings. I hope that's, uh, you're doing fine so far, definitely. Um, quick question. There wasn't a, a motion made after the presentation of the committee, and that's usually normally when comments are made on things. Um, when do you suspect will be the time for people to make uh, public comments on, on that, or will it be when you're considering the wording for the resolution. I don't know if that will be public. Uh, there wasn't a motion to receive their recommendation for discussion. Yep. Was there a, an you item You caught that? me at my first meeting already making my first gaffe. No, 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 no? That, no. I don't think that was a gaffe. The intention tonight was to receive a presentation from the committee. That uh, There will be discussion at the next regular meeting about the the ballot proposal. Okay, that's what that's what I was like. I wasn't suggesting that there was a gaffe. No, no. I was just wondering when that time would be. Oh, I've been waiting for it to happen. So that's oh, okay. 
Okay. January so 24th, two weeks from tonight, we'll have an agenda item dealing with the Headley override ballot proposal. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. The, the report, that 30-page that report that they were talking about, will also be posted online in the interim. We haven't yet received it. Okay. But residents will be able to take a look at that before the... Will that uh, January 24th meeting also be the uh, Bob Bruner roast <laughs> for his last meeting? If for no other reason than due to its length, I think it will probably be a long one. All right. We'll roast you enough then. Thank All right. You. Thank you. Thank you. I see the chair of our Chamber of Commerce. Hi. Good evening, council members. Um, most of you know me. I'm Jennifer Rosenberg, the executive director at the Ferndale Area Chamber of Commerce. I just wanted to publicly announce that um, 1936, 75 years ago, was the year that the chamber was incorporated in the state of Michigan. Um, so we will be celebrating our 75th anniversary all year long. Um, we just wanted to come out and thank the city of Ferndale for working so closely and growing up with us over the past 75 years. Uh, we look forward to continuing to work with you, um, whoever is brought on as your new council member and the uh, interim city manager. We're looking forward to uh, continuing that relationship and um, working together to improve the city and uh, support you as well. So that's all I had to say, and we'll keep you posted as to what our celebrations are going to be over the next few months. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else for public comment? How does Ann Heller not have an announcement about? <laughs> okay, I won't force her. Okay. Uh, sorry, overexcited for care board member. All right, we will close public comment then. And Madam Clerk, the next item on the agenda, please. That would be the consent agenda, Your Honor. Item A, approval of the minutes of the December 28th regular meeting. Item B, approval to forfeit the bid bond regarding the purchase proposal for 803 East Breckenridge and re-advertise the property for sale. Item C, approval to reappoint Phil Poole to the Board of Review for a term ending December 31st, 2012. Item D, approval to reappoint Bob Porter and John Scope to the Board of Zoning Appeals. Um, and those terms are not listed here, I apologize. Item E, approval of the contract with Tammy Murray, housing inspector, effective January 18th, 2011, and authorization for the mayor pro tem to sign the contract. <laughs> Item F, approval to authorize the police department to complete the hiring process and fill the vacancy of the service aid position. And finally, item G, approval of the bills and payrolls is certified by the city manager to be paid subject to review by the council finance committee. Are there any items that council members or members of the audience would like to pull from the consent agenda? Is there a motion to approve? So move. Support. Support. <laughs> I heard Councilwoman Piana first, uh, seconding Councilman Lennon's motion. And I just have a question. <clears throat> Usually we don't have any discussion or uh, request for information on the consent agenda, but we have <clears throat> Phil Poole being reappointed to the uh, Board of Review on the consent agenda, and Tom King is being appointed because he's no, he's no longer on there right now. And because no he's an alternate member he's an alternate and he's being member. elevated to regular <coughs> member. So it's technically a new appointment. That's correct. All right, we are ready for a vote then. Council members Lennon. Yes. Yana. Yes. Galloway. Yes. And Mayor Pro Tem Baker. Yes. And we will move to the next item on the agenda. That would be regular agenda item A, consideration of appointments to boards and commissions. Uh, first would be Mr. Tom King to the Board of Review for a term ending December 31st, 2012. Would you like to introduce this? Certainly, Your Honor. Um, as I just said, um, Mr. King has previously served on the Board of Review. He has um, recently been a um, alternate member and with Suzanne Rao not wanting to be reappointed it creates a vacancy for the regular board and Mr. King has expressed interest <coughs> in serving as that regular member he certainly has the experience on the board and um, Jamory Cubanks who now oversees that board is in agreement with this recommendation are there any requests for information I would move that we confirm the appointment of Tom King to the Board of Review for a term ending December 31, 2012. Second. Moved by Galloway, supported by Lennon. 
Can you vote, please? Council members Piano? Yes. Galloway? Yes. Lennon? Yes. And Mayor Pro Tem Baker? Yes. Okay. Do I need to announce that the motion passes? Or um, <laughs> you can or I can, however you'd hmm. like to do that. Councilman Galloway is whispering something to me. And that motion passes unanimously, clearly. And the next item? That would be uh, the second appointment to a board or commission, and this would be Scott Lavassier to the Board of Zoning Appeals for a term ending December 31st, 2012. City Manager Bruner, this is um, under one of your employees. Do you have any to add? Just that um, Sam Michelli, uh, his term's expiring, he doesn't wish to be reappointed, so that's why this, um, this vacancy uh, has come up. And I do have a, a quick question. I know that there have been questions in the past about vacancies being appropriately advertised, and I know that there have been a series of emails uh, to the city staff who generally make these recommendations, uh, reminding them that they need to inform the city clerk immediately as vacancies occur. That's correct. Is that happening? Um, it is getting much better, Your Honor. Yes. Um, I, if I may say with the BZA, because they have two alternates, alternates mm -hmm. um, it is standard practice to promote one of the alternates to the regular seat if interested. And so now that there's a vacant alternate seat, that will be posted that this posted. week, yes. Would that be similar for the Board of Review position where we've just elevated Tom King? That's correct. There will be an alternate position available there as well. Thank you. Any other requests for information? Is there a motion? I move to appoint Scott Lebesseur to the Board of Zoning Appeals for a term ending December 31st, 2012. Is there a second? Second. Councilman Lennon seconds Councilman Piano's motion. Is there any discussion? Um, I just want to say Scott has served um, on a, quite a few meetings already for the BZA, and I think he will be a great addition. I'm very sad to see Sam Shelley leave. He has new responsibilities helping build homes in Haiti. So, All right, a vote, City Clerk. Council Members Galloway? Yes. Lennon? Yes. Piana? Yes. And Mayor Pro Tem Baker? Yes. The motion passes. And the next item, please. That brings us to regular agenda item B, which is consideration of applications for the vacant office of mayor. Thank you very much. As people here and at home notice, um, Mayor Covey is not here with us today. I am filling in in my role as Mayor Pro Tem. And before Mayor Covey left us, we laid out a procedure for accepting applications to fill the mayoral vacancy and potentially any council vacancy that, sh that could occur if a council member applied to fill the mayor's seat. None of the council members have applied to fill the mayor's seat. Um, there were five people um, who applied just for the council position. Um, so those, those five um, who had amazingly varied backgrounds. I'm really actually looking forward to getting to know some of the people who were interested in applying for this council seat. Um, but to those five, I, I want to say thank you. Um, thank you very much for submitting your application. It doesn't look like we'll have a council vacancy, but as we've just discussed, uh, there are many other boards and commissions in the city. The application that you filled out for the council vacancy is exactly the same as what you would fill out um, for a board or commission appointment. I would encourage you to take a look online, and even if there don't appear to be any vacancies on the commission that you might enjoy serving on, please submit an application anyway. Those applications are always retained for a year, and as openings do happen in the, in the course of time, um, those applications then come to council to make appointments. So again, thank you very much for those who only applied um, for, the, for the council vacancy. There doesn't look like there'll be one um, right now, but we really appreciate um, your interest. And we, we had a, a really great number of applications um, we had, where is my agenda? Seven, in addition to the five people who applied for a potential council vacancy, we had seven people apply either for the mayoral position or either the mayor or the council. Uh, those seven people, um, according to my notes, um, and this is just alphabetical, I believe, as listed in our That's, agenda, mm -hmm. are Douglas Campbell, David Coulter, Michelle Foster, Thomas Gagne, Gregory Lowry, Robert Porter, and Raymond Willis. We have your applications, and much as we did for the 
Financial Planning Committee appointments. I would look to council members to make nominations of people that they would like to interview on the 24th. We would then invite um, people who were nominated um, and then approved by a vote tonight to come back and join us on the 24th for a formal interview. Just, so open to, it up to nominations. Oh, just to clarify, we're going to vote on each <coughs> person we invite. So it'll be separate motions for each one? Separate motions for each person. Okay. <clears throat> then I'd like to start with the uh, proposed nomination of Dave Coulter. I think uh, Dave's experience in the community and in Pontiac makes him an uh, ideal choice for a uh, candidate to uh, sit up here and assist us through what's going to be a difficult budget season. Uh, I nominate, or I would move that we uh, interview Dave Coulter for the position of mayor of the city of Ferndale. Second. A second by <laughs> Councilman Lennon of Councilman Galloway's motion. A vote, please. Council members Lennon? Yes. Piana? Yes. Galloway? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Baker? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, I nominate uh, Mr. Porter, Robert Porter, to be interviewed by City Council for the position of mayor. Is there a second? Second. Councilwoman Piana seconds Councilman Lennon's motion. And a vote, please. Council members Piana? Yes. Galloway? Yes. Lennon? Yes. And Mayor Pro Tem Baker? Yes, and I'm sorry, I'm, I realize that I'm actually not asking if any of you have questions or comments, so please elbow me if I go too fast. Mm -hmm. Any other motions or I no, move that I'm we, not uh, able to make motions? I um, interview Thomas Gagne as he's been involved in the community um, for some time now to be interviewed. Support or second? There is support by Councilwoman Piana for Councilman Lennon's motion. Is there discussion? And a vote? Well, I guess I would um, comment on this one. Uh, <clears throat> Tom has certainly been involved in uh, some different things in the community. Uh, I don't think he's the right choice uh, to sit up here at this time. Uh, I'm not sure he has the, uh, the temperament and the team player skills to get us through this budget cycle. So. Uh, for those reasons, I wouldn't support that. I'm looking for a candidate who has worked to build trust and who I can trust. Um, and unfortunately, I don't feel that Tom has worked to build my trust um, personally. So I have a I have a choice at this point. You know, had he been elected, I would do my absolute best to work with him. Um, but at this point, I would not choose to appoint him to this body. Um, Any other? Well, I concur on those. Um, I think his style and manner um, is not something that I um, see as conducive to problem solving up here. And so I um, kind of believe that Tom's against everything. So I'm of that opinion. Any other discussion on the motion? And a vote, City Clerk? Certainly. Council Members Galloway? No. Excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm not sure. I believe the audience member may want to speak to the motion. I'm sorry. Please come forward. <coughs> I do think it's very obvious that your prejudice is showing here in bias. In other words, you're wanting people that go along with you on whatever you say and do. As long as we run this city this way, things are going to continue as they are. Thank you very much for your comment. Any other comments? Then a vote, City Clerk. Certainly, Your Honor. Council Members Galloway? No. Lennon? Yes. Piana? No. Mayor Pro Tem Baker? No. The yeah, motion fails. <coughs> Are there any other nominations from the council for interviews? I'm not able to make a nomination, but am I able to express a preference? Sure. Um, there was another person on this list who has done um, a lot of positive work in the in this community. Um, she's not been a resident for very long, um, but I would encourage the council to take a look at Michelle Foster's application and her credentials. Um, I agree with your assessment, uh, <coughs> Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, Michelle's work with the Time Bank and her involvement with the uh, DDA and in, in the community shows a uh, interest uh, in solving the problems of the city of Ferndale. And um, while perhaps she's a bit uh, less experienced in municipal affairs than some of the other folks, 
I'd like to hear her ideas uh, for the position of mayor. Um, I guess uh, I would be inclined to probably go with someone who's a bit more experienced, but um, I'm interested in hearing what she has to say and, and what she brings to the table. So I would move uh, that we interview Michelle Foster for the position of mayor of the city of Ferndale. Is there support for that? Support. Support from Councilwoman Piana for Councilman Galloway's motion. Is there discussion on the motion? Well, I don't know, Michelle. Um, I know hold no biases. Um, if I had my choice, all seven people up here remaining would be interviewed. Obviously, I don't get a, a, a choice in that matter, but uh, I will vote for Michelle. It's absurd because you guys want her up here. I'll give you that much. I would only expect you to vote your conscience. We are ready for a vote then. Council Members Lennon? Yes. Kiana? Yes. Galloway? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Baker? Yes. Motion carries. Are there any other nominations for interviewing the position of mayor? Seeing none, I again just want to point out that we had a, a wonderful variety of applications for this position as well. Um, we had people with construction backgrounds. There was a minister who formed a vegan community group, <laughs> um, an engineer with a, a passion for con conservation, obviously our, our former mayor, county, county commissioner, as well as numerous community organizers um, who'd worked in the region. Um, a, a great group of people um, that I'm definitely looking forward to getting to know. We've got a comment from the audience. So, um, I'm Ray Willis. I live at uh, 530 Wanda. I applied for this position. Mm -hmm. um, I would have liked to uh, been interviewed for the job, but since that's not the way it's working here, I guess I'll just say that I'll be back in November to run the general elections. Thank you for your time. Thank you. If there are no other motions on this topic, then the next item of business. That will be a regular agenda item. See your honor consideration of interim city manager appointment. Thank you. And City Manager Bruner, would you please introduce this for us? I'd be happy, passing us a note. be happy to, Your Honor. What I'm passing down right now is just the language of the recommended uh, action tonight. <laughs> and obviously it's up to the council to fill in the blank as to who they wish to appoint the, uh, the interim city manager. But just to review for the folks in the audience, uh, the council interviewed uh, former Auburn Hills City Manager Mike Culpepper and uh, former Gross Point Woods City Administrator Mark Wollenweber at a special meeting last Thursday night. Um, the council decided not to make a decision at that time to uh, essentially sleep on it and to call around and check a few references and uh, to delay a decision uh, tonight. Uh, so tonight you have before you a, a recommended action to do so. Thank you very much. Are there any requests for information from the council? Seeing none, is there a motion? I would move that we offer the interim city manager position to Mark Wollenweber based on his executive and administrative qualifications. Contingent upon satisfactory background check as required by section 2.5 of the Ferndale Code and that we direct the city manager to negotiate an employment agreement for the council's consideration at his January 24, 2011 regular meeting. Second. There is support from Councilman Lennon for Councilman Galloway's motion that we um, offer the position to Mark Wallenweber. Any comments? Yes. Oh, okay. If you may, if I may. Oh, yeah, first. Go ahead. Um, I'll jump in I wanted to say I supported um, uh, Mr. Wallenweber um, because he brings um, experience, a wealth of experience, to two major issues that we need to deal with um, while he's an interim city manager. And that is one dealing with um, the uh, budgets and Headley override issues um, or recommendations for the, the city to consider at our May elections. And the other one is um, police and fire um, discussions and, and, and arbitration issues. So those are key over the next two months. So those are the two issues that um, I thought Mr. Wallenbummer will best serve the community. I think the choice was um, we had two great candidates who came with excellent city manager um, skills and experience, but um, in terms of where I think the city needs to really hone um, in the next six months as we search for a full time was, was those two priority areas. 
Well, um, when we interviewed uh, the, the two candidates, I was very impressed with Mr. Culpepper. Um, I know he could do a good job for us, but I just think the depth of Mr. Wollenweber's uh, experience and his, uh, his experience handling uh, financial crises in St. Clair Shores is really best suited to our situation. So um, while Mr. Culpepper, I think, would be an excellent choice under different circumstances, uh, I think Mr. Wollenweber is going to serve us best right now. We, I, I commend you, City Manager. We had great, um, we had great choices. We had um, four or five great choices. We ended up interviewing two very experienced gentlemen. Um, I wasn't quite sure that evening, and absolutely feel that either could do um, exactly what we need them to. I've heard um, nothing but good things about both of them, and I'm prepared to support Mr. Wallenweber this evening. Around on some references. Yep, I was very impressed. I think we are ready for a vote, City Clerk. Certainly. I'm struggling tonight, I apologize. Council members Piana? Yes. Galloway? Yes. Lennon? Yes. And Mayor Pro Tem Baker? Yes. The motion, motion passes. passes. And I believe we have another item on the agenda? We do. We now have regular agenda item D, which is consideration of a resolution of condolence for the family of oh. James Rents. I would look to Council Member Lennon. Yes, ma'am. James R. Rents, 81, a lifelong resident of Ferndale, died Tuesday, January 4th, 2011 in Royal Oak. He was born November 30th, 1929 in Highland Park, Michigan to Joseph and Minnie Rents. He married Maureen Hunt on April 7, 1956, at St. James Catholic Church. Mr. Rents was hired by the Ferndale Police Department on October 1, 1954, as a police officer. After being employed by the department for 10 and a half years, he resigned to work in the insurance field. Mr. Rents served as the city of Ferndale's auctioneer for 31 years, from 1979 until his death. He was very civic-minded and was elected as constable from 1993 until the office was eliminated by voters in 2001. Mr. Rents was appointed to the Civil Service Board in September of 1980 and served until January of 1999, spending many of those years as the chair of the board, and he served on the Downtown Development Authority Board as well. Until his death, he was employed as a ranger for the Evergreen Hills Golf Course in Southfield. James Rents will be missed by many, but especially his wife, Maureen, daughter, Lori, son, Joseph, brother, Joseph, and his dog, Maggie. Therefore, be it resolved that we, for the elected officials, do hereby extend our community condolences to the family of James R. Rents. Do I have support for that? Support. Support, support Councilwoman Piano? What's that? Yes. Support for the resolution? Yes. Thank you. There is unanimous support for that. And with nothing pulled from the consent agenda, I believe that we are moving to Council Liaison Report. We are. Any reports, City Manager or Council Members, uh, from the Nonprofit organizations that we are members of. All right, then next item, City Clerk. That would be call to council, Your Honor. All right, thank you very much. We'll see if I do the round robin correctly, and please jump up and down if I miss you in the audience. So, I guess starting on this side of the room, we will start with our illustrious police chief, Chief Tim Collins. <laughs> right next to him, our fire chief. And Chief Sullivan's coming up. All right, our illustrious Chief Kevin Sullivan. What have you got for us this evening? Mayor, Council, uh, not too much. We did have a fire on Hazelhurst. Uh, it was an arson. Uh, the arsonist has turned himself in and is awaiting his trial. Um, there was a substantial damage to the property, but we were able to stop it on the second floor, so saving everybody's property down below. And all residents were safe and accounted for? Nobody injured. That went great. And firefighters safe and accounted for? Everybody's safe. Wonderful. Nothing but property damaged. Thank you, Chief. Our Recreation Director, Julie Hall, is with us this evening. Julie Hall, who I think has probably sat through every Financial Planning Committee meeting. Yes, I do have that, uh, I guess, distinction. <laughs> distinction. I don't know where to put that. Um, Mayor, Council, uh, just a heads up to the public that we did put out on Friday our first online newsletter. Um, that is 
One of the things that came up in our master plan process that uh, the public was interested in the online version uh, that did go out on Friday, um, with the software we're using, we're actually able to tell um, open rates uh, on that, so that's very helpful to us. Um, so I would encourage, uh, if you haven't given us your email, to please do so. That is how we are getting most of our information out uh, now, and we are doing that on a monthly basis. We'll continue to um, put um, periodic ads in the Ferndale Friends and some of the other local newspapers, but we are uh, listening to the public and going online and reducing costs. So that saves us roughly $10,000 a year by going online. So uh, please forward it on to your email list. Uh, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. A look at our city clerk, Cheryl and Tallman. Nothing tonight, Your Honor. How did the move to Michigan State go? Excellent. Congratulations <laughs> to your son for yes, sharing. Yes, thank college. you. And our city manager, Bob Bruner. I wanted to um, also thank the Financial Planning Committee. Um, they have really attempted to, to look at the city's finances at, in great depth, at a level of depth that I certainly didn't anticipate they would attempt, in, given the, the relatively short amount of time in which we, we asked them to conduct their work. We do have some deadlines that we're, we're working against as a city in order for uh, to levy an increased tax on July 1, which is when the next fiscal year begins, it has to go on the ballot by this May. In order to put something on the ballot this May, the council has to approve it by roughly February um, 2nd. So the, uh, our time has been short throughout due to some external um, deadlines, but the Financial Planning Committee has really put a, a lot of effort into it and, and taken their charge very seriously. And I and also thank Julie Hall for um, making the community center available uh, to them for, for their meetings. I think she actually probably attended more of the meetings than I did. I, I had to miss a few, but the community center generally closes, I believe, at 8 o'clock, and the financial planning uh, committee worked until 9 and sometimes 10 o'clock um, fairly routinely. Uh, so that it was a, a really good uh, team effort in order to, uh, to get that done, so I appreciate, appreciate your work and your dedication in that. And our city attorney, Dan Christ. I have nothing tonight, Your Honor. Thank you. To um, yes, to the men and women of the uh, Financial Planning Committee, many thanks. I know how hard it was. I talked to several members. That's tedious. Um, so my thank you. And on a local level, well, semi-local, actually international level, yeah. uh, about a month ago, the owners of one of our business, Mr. Jack Aronson, and one of our police officers, uh, Officer Andrew Worm, traveled to Haiti. Uh, they're very involved in the relief efforts there. Uh, Jack was a sizable donation uh, to put fuel in the medical vehicles, and I believe Officer Worm took some vests. Is that correct, Chief? Took some bulletproof vests for uh, the police over there. Um, as you can imagine, the devastation. Well, now they're really involved, and tomorrow night, at Boogie Fever, $10 per person. It is a fundraiser for the relief effort. It's being hosted by Garden Fresh. Um, several radio stations will be there, I believe. They have Jay Towers doing the MCN. There'll be music, dancing, food, and a cash bar. It's at Boogie Fever, 5 to 10 p.m. tomorrow. Um, if you need more information, the website is mmrcglobal.org. That's mmrcglobal.org. You can learn more about the organization that they're sponsoring, um, but it's uh, and they're encouraging children and families to come to this event tomorrow. So um, it'll be good. And, and, and I could get real in-depth on in how this goes, how deep this goes, and who's involved, but I won't go to the website or show up tomorrow. And there'll be some speeches by some people. Okay, and that's all I have. Will you be there? Uh, yeah, he's my boss. I, I gotta that's go. that's why I asked. All right. Well. Continue down the line with Councilman Galloway. We're going to mix it up. All right. Uh, <laughs> thanks again to the Financial Planning Committee. Uh, great job, great presentation. You clarified the issues, I think, for the uh, voters and um, for us up here. So thanks for all that hard work. And thanks for everybody who put their name in for the vacancy up here on Council. Uh, we couldn't interview everybody. I regret that. But uh, I think we've got uh, three interesting folks to speak to coming up and uh, look forward to uh, what they have to say on the 24th. And Councilwoman Piano? Yes, I have more uh, information about how to access more information about taxes. Um, 
the Citizens for Research Council um, released Citizens to, Research Council sorry, Michigan. yes, sorry, Citizens Research Council of Michigan um, released uh, a report and access a report this week on an outline of the Michigan tax system. And it uh, has in there the legal authority, the rate, the base, administration, the amount of revenue, the taxes raised by city for the state of Michigan. So you can do a cost, you can do a comparison by county, comparison by city, village, township. And the CRC is a, um, um, a 501c3 that does research um, nonpartisan research on the state of Michigan, so you know that this information is fair and balanced. And, well, I'm not going there. Um, <laughs> so um, it's just something to also look at to see how revenue is or taxes are changing. I mean, I think people forget that state revenue sharing was to equalize tax rates among communities, and that was the goal of state shared revenue. Um, and now that goal is no longer being achieved, and so revenue is going away. So as all cities are looking at how do we shore up our, our finances and provide the services, you see that the tax rates are now fluctuating among cities as they, cho as they, as they choose to um, raise uh, revenue to um, balance their budgets. And you see that the, the equalizing <coughs> is no longer a part of revenue sharing. So everybody, every city is kind of out for themselves. Um, in terms of this. So I just thought it was an interesting, um, another interesting aid of in piece of information that can help tell the story and provide data of why, what's happening and what choices cities are making. So that's all I have. Um, you can go visit crcmich.org. It's on their homepage. Thank you. And again, my very sincere thanks to our, our Citizens Financial Committee. The, and the questions that you've helped us answer as council, because although we do have diverse backgrounds up here and come from diverse financial situations, you have only augmented that. Um, and you've helped us answer some really tough questions. Um, and I, I know that we will we'll hear from the voters um, in, well, assuming that we, we go to the ballot in May, um, about what Ferndale is, is willing to sacrifice in order to keep it looking and feeling like the city um, that we all value and love so much. So thank you very much for also making it clear that there is no easy situation. There's no easy out here. There's no easy answer. There is no magic bullet. There will be, as there has to be at the state level, I imagine as well, a balance of revenue increases and budget cuts. Um, it's, there, there has to be a balance or we're going to tip too far in one direction or the other. Um, and I see that uh, Chairman Porter is bouncing in his seat. I, I, I just wanted to ask the committee um, <coughs> as if they haven't spent enough time. Yeah. But uh, obviously you can contact us anytime once you've read the document if you have questions and so forth. But I was asked if you would like the board members, as many as can, to uh, be at the next council meeting when that's discussed. Someone may have questions as to about how we came to a conclusion on an issue and so forth, and we would be happy to facilitate if that's what you would like. Any who are able are obviously always welcome at our council meetings. They're open meetings. Um, if there are a few members who are able to join us, that would be wonderful and above and beyond the call of duty, literally. Um, being here right now, I think, is technically above and beyond the call of duty because I think we ended your call of duty as of December 31st on paper, um, but here you still are, um, and thank you very much. And I would uh, like to ask the, the city clerk um, if he would work with the city manager to draft a resolution of thanks to our Citizens oh, Financial Planning well, Committee. Um, I would love to give you a little something to to maybe put on the wall or, you know, add to your giant pile of paper that you must have after the Citizens Financial Planning Committee. I would also ask the city clerk um, if you would contact the three interviewees that we decided on tonight with the specifics of the interview process. I believe as we laid it out, um, although you can refer back to the minutes, I'm sure, um, that we would allow for a, a f about 20 minutes per person, a five minute um, personal introduction and statement, then followed by questions and answers with the council. Um, Certainly, would you like me to notify the other applicants as well of your please. decision? Okay, will do. Thank you very much. You're welcome. They're all in the room. I think that's done. 
Are they? It's still important to be formal. Put it in writing. There will be no questions um, as to whether what time we were starting or where you were supposed to be or when. Um, I think that that's all for this evening. I think I came through with maybe just a few little slip-ups. We, well. we will work on it for next time. Um, and I am adjourning this meeting officially before 10 o'clock just for you, Mike. Yeah, I appreciate it.